Okay, so let's look at this. Because I will show you, especially that rule right there, rule 4.1, truthfulness and statements to others. Let's do this. I want to make sure you guys are able to see that. Lawyers shall not knowingly make a false statement of material facts or law to a third person or fail to disclose a material fact to a third person uh, when disclosure is necessary to Okay, so make sure you guys get that. You could probably just screenshot it and go from there. But if if nothing else, you can look up uh, Rule 4.1, Truthfulness and Statements to Others. Attorney shall not make false statements. And and there, as you can see at the bottom, I put. The document is necessary. The document is at issue here. The document is at issue here. It's good case law at the bottom there. And as you see at the top there, that's that constitutional due process. Violation of that constitution due process. When a uh, attorney failed to disclose evidence in a court record and a judge doesn't look at the evidence, that's a violation of that due process of uh, law. So, trying to get it in there. You guys can probably screenshot that. And if you want more information, well, you already know, total public exposure, make sure you subscribe. You might want to screenshot that as well. The trial court judge judge's duty to avoid a mischaracter of justice. So, you guys are going to have to understand, this is uh, my first uh, getting familiar with putting videos out, so if you bear with me, I'm going to learn some stuff, and you're going to learn some stuff with me. Um, see that part right there, where it says, let me see if I can blow that up for you. Oh, don't, damn it. Hold on. Okay, we're back. Um, that part right there says that an employer or judges cannot make an independent medical findings. I wanted to blow that up. However, employers or judges cannot make independent medical findings. There's your case law on that. That's a federal case law. Seventh Circuit, 1990. Check this piece out right here. Underneath there, also. California Penal Code, 471.5. No one, any person, shall not alter, modify, or change a medical record of any person with fraudulent intent. Section 66.46 .46 talks about signature requirement. If you're going to hold a party 
uh, charged by signing something, you have to have their agreement at the bottom of that uh, statement or contract or a written agreement, whatever it is. You have to have that party signature showing that that party agreed to whatever it is that uh, you're saying that he should be charged with. Said it must have uh, contract formation. So look that up, contract formation. Says before judgment can be entered, two key things must happen. Both are which, both of which are missing in this case. And one of them is contract formation, and the other one is, let's see, what is that other one? Oh. The written must be signed by the person to be charged. This is written must be signed by the party contained in the material terms. Section 664.6. If you don't have that party signature on that agreement, contract, or whatever it is, it says uh, there is no basis for the judgment entered. Check out this case law. That's 1980, 1998. That's that flick. Production company and flick. So, again, Shepard Mullen, Richard and Hampton, Crooked Law Firm. The judge was involved in this case, which... Ruth Ann Kwan, I'll spell her name for you, Ruth, is R-U-T-H-N-A-N-N, -N -N. Kwan, K-W-A-N, Ruth Ann Kwan. You can Google her name and see what the comments people left under her uh, name. You'll find out she's a very corrupt judge, Ruth Ann Kwan. They had nothing nice to say about her. I don't understand why she is still on the bench, Ruth Ann Kwan. Another thing, for those of you who do not know, it says right here, there is no statute of limitation when a party seeks to set aside a judgment due to fraud upon a court. So if you uh, find out 10 or 15 years later that fraud has been perpetrated on you by a lawyer or a judge, those two people are officers of the court. And there is no statute of limitation when a party uh, seeks to set aside a judgment due to fraud upon a court. Now make sure you can screenshot that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or study there. Screenshot that. Well, I don't want to make this video too long, so. You guys get a chance to screenshot this stuff and then blow it up and you can read it. Or you can just uh, Google the name McNeely versus Swift and you'll find a lot of this stuff in the course record. Um, I think I'll title this video Corrupt Law Firm Shepard Mullen and Corrupt Judges uh, such as Ruth Ann Kwan dirty lawyers, uh, corrupt lawyers, such as Jason W. Kerrigan. Um, these people pay off judges to um, give decisions in their favor, even though they present no evidence in a court record. Check this out. I had a judge tell me one time that the uh, test is very important in a case. And in this case, the test is, it says right there, let's see if I have to blow that up for you. Let's see if that helps. The test is whether the undisclosed evidence was so important that its absence prevented the plaintiff from receiving his constitutional guaranteed fair trial now 
that's the test, right? So make sure you guys can screenshot that. I'll let it let's see here so you can get a good shot at it. In my case, when you talk about the evidence, you find that the defendants never submitted any evidence in the court record. So it doesn't look good for them. This case get over to the feds, I'll tear these guys a new asshole. Just watch and see. So I'm gonna show you my secret weapon. In this case, we have a handwriting expert. And the handwriting expert said, according to that document, the personal leave of absence. Remember we read about, he said they gave him a personal leave of absence. Here's what she says about that personal leave of absence. She's a uh, forensic expert document examiner. This is her sworn opinion. She says, based on, focus, basically she says, uh, based on the documents that was presented to her, she said the Dillard McNeely of the known document did not handprint or sign the document in question. Further, the person who handprinted the document information and dated the form is the same person who wrote cannot reach driver on the employee signature line. So basically, the handwriting expert told you the whole form was filled out by one person. So contract law requires to be two parties or more in order to have an agreement, right? Contract law, two parties or more in order to have an agreement. How can you have an agreement when one person? She said the entire form was filled out by one person. And... His signature on the signature line, it says, cannot reach driver. So who name is cannot reach driver? Damn sure ain't my name. These people are crazy. Tell you, this case get to the feds, we're going to rip them a new asshole. McNeely versus Shepard Mullen. Check me out. McNeely versus Shepard Mullen. Big time corrupt law firm.